So I find that when people talk about Me Too, that is the rampant sexual harassment and assault against women and sometimes men and maybe more than sometimes children, that people talk about it in terms of patriarchy, power, and sexuality run amok. What I'd like our frame to be this morning is actually what I think lays beneath all three of those, which is objectification of people, instrumentalizing people for our own needs, or as Immanuel Kant put it, using another human being as merely a means to my own ends, rather than as an end in and of themselves. Of course, we use other people all the time. We do. Our food, our clothing, our technology, they're all products of the talents and the abilities of other people. In our relationships, our friends, our family, our significant others, they serve practical and emotional ends for us. In some relationships, there are power imbalances, where one party serves the interests of another party. In employment, even in a restaurant, when someone's serving you your food. But in those cases, the relationship remains moral only insofar as the person on the other end is not only viewed as a means to my goals, but also has an existence of their own. When is it that they don't retain that existence that ends in and of itself? When we don't care about their health, when we don't care about their working conditions, when we don't care about the fairness of their wages, when we don't care about their hurt, their needs, their feelings, when we strip them of their agency and ability to act and determine their future, when we do not care about their understanding of their own identity and aspirations. What I'm trying to say is that what's underneath Me Too is actually related to lots of ways in which we instrumentalize people and objectify people. And in situations of sexual harassment and assault, this line is crossed. And again, it's not because people can't serve each other's desires and needs in certain ways. Of course they can. But when it's the service of these desires or needs for power or sexual attraction or gratification that doesn't take into, the, into account the other person as subject, that's where we run amok. And in this midrash, I think there's a lot of rumination about this question of object versus subject. And that's how I'd like to look at it. As we read through this midrash, I'm actually going to think about this woman's identity, our protagonist, and how it shifts. How it shifts based on her own actions and speech. How it shifts based on her context. That is the structures and relationships in which she lives and how it changes and morphs due to the composition of this very folk story itself. You may have been asking yourselves while you were reading, what is this? Where is this from? This is wild. It is. What we know is that there's a manuscript of it, 13th century French, in Hebrew, but 13th century France. That's what we know. We know a little bit more, but I'm going to tell you that later. What I, will, what I will say is that this is actually a trope in folklore. It's called the justice piety trope, where you have a person who is pious, and she is accused and unjustly punished for committing acts of lewdness. That's all I'm going to say about it right now. Before we jump in, I presented in the intro to Chavruta almost as though this midrash, I can't believe that it's in the Jewish canon, it's going to save us from everything. No, it isn't. First of all, it's not going to save us from everything because you've never seen it before. And the fact that you've never seen it before tells me something about our curriculum. That's one. Two, it's not going to save us because here's a question. Would we even be having this conversation if the protagonist wasn't married? and people were simply harassing and trying to rape her, and she wasn't married. Another question, what does it mean to end this story by saying, and you know what we learn from this? 
Don't tell Lush and Hara, kids. What is that sanitizing element? Or I'll ask it differently. What happens when at the end of the story of someone's triumph, all you're focused on is the perpetrator and you're not actually focused on the victim turned hero? What, what does that say about our culture? And there are other questions that we'll raise along the way. With all this in mind, let's jump into our 13th century Jewish medieval folklore, number two. Remember, we've got four acts. Can I just get people to call out what biblical characters she is over the course of this midrash in general? Just call some out, call, call it out. Okay, I got Tamar, I've got Joseph, I've got Jonah, I've got Ruth, I've got Asav, Tamar I heard already, Eov, God, you notice that one, Act 2, you notice that one? Shlomo, Alicia, Abel, Abraham, Jesus. So I'm, I'm going to, just for my own theological comfort, I'm now going to put biblical in quotes, okay? For my own theological comfort, yes. I had another, near? Oh, Mordechai. Okay. Dina. Eliyahu. Chava. The, the Israelites, or maybe just the Jewish people of all time, right? We keep getting batted around and try to understand why that's happening and when the end is going to be. Okay, great. Let's keep all that in mind. I'm going to do some of that, but not all of that. <laughs> Number two. Ma'aseh ba'adam echad shahalach li There was a fellow who went on a business trip. Ve'heniach et ishto l'achiv. And he left his wife to his brother. Already the object as opposed to subject bells are going off. You don't leave a person, at least not an adult, to someone else. You speak to a person and talk to them about what's going to be. Has the implication that there's a power dynamic, has the implication that she needs to be guarded in some way. Vitsivalo, and he said to him, Achi, my brother, sim einecha velibecha al ishti, Keep your eyes and your heart on my wife. Le'ovda u'leshomra to guard her like the Garden of Eden, or I don't know to work her. Ad she'ashuv until I return le'shalom in peace. Ve'analo achiv, his brother answered, "Esekid varecha, I will do what you." say. Does anybody get the feeling that something's about to go wrong? <laughs> the ambiguity, I want to say two things. Number one, the ambiguity of what he says to his brother, the fact that she's not in the conversation, and I just want you to know that a woman left alone with her brother-in-law, who if the husband doesn't come back, as she has no children, will become her yavam, will become her husband. That in and of itself, the ambiguity that's built into that relationship, you can feel that tension. Halach ha'ish l'schorato, so he left. B'derech rechoka, he went very far. V'nish'ar ha'isha levada biyad achi ba'ala. And the woman is left alone in the hands of, again, object, in the hands of her brother-in-law. Now, for those who looked up the Yosef parallels, what you notice already is that Potiphar gives Yosef into Yosef's hand anything except his wife, right? Here, this man gives only his wife. Masa, what did he do? Just like the wife of Potiphar. He would go in day after day, come back and forth, and say to her, listen to me, or 
obey me, ve'aseh kol chafatzech, and I will do anything you need or you want, ve'etein lach kol ma shetirzi, and I'll give you anything you want. Now, on the one hand, there's a part of this that says his attraction to her is not just objectifying her, because he talks to her, and he says, I'll give you whatever you want. But there's another piece that says, this is classical harassment. Each and every day, this person comes in and pressures again and again. So let's not mistake the fact that he's having a conversation for her with her with the idea that this is not objectification. Vihil meritlo. And she says to him, Khalila li zot. I can't do this. Why? Shekol ha makreshet leba'ala, makreshet lebor'a. Anyone who denies their husband denies their creator. What is that? Meaning just answer from the Ten Commandments and say, you're not allowed to sleep with a married woman, so you shouldn't do that. She starts with herself. When she answers, yeah, of course, her selfhood is about her husband. It's still medieval, my friends. We're not going to fix that. But she doesn't start with him. She starts with herself. Her voice turns her already from an object into a subject. The ode, and moreover, I will go to hell for this. If you really care about me, I will go to hell for this. And your brother, it's, my husband is your brother, meaning don't you care about your brother? It's not just me. Care about your brother. Same words, right? Same words. That, that Potiphar puts, right? And he gave me to you in your hand, lishmoroti, to keep me, to safeguard me, velo lechabel nafshi v'nafshecha, and not to harm me and you. Ve'ech ta'ale b'da'atcha lishloach yad b'pikadon achicha. How would you ever imagine, haven't you ever learned tractate Bava Metzia that teaches you about the laws of a pikadon, of something that someone leaves in your entrust, that you're not allowed to use it. You have to just leave it there. How does she know this? How does she know this? He put me here as a picadon, right? How does she know this stuff? She opens her mouth. She, she demands her subjectivity. And she also knows a lot, either in Torah or the way of the world, maybe business, right? What does it mean when somebody financially, they have you hold something for them, it doesn't mean you can use it. This is not so that you could go into a domain that isn't yours. And moreover, forget about, you don't care about me, don't care about me. You don't care about my husband who's your brother, don't care about him. But care about yourself. Don't you realize that I am your brother's wife? And I am prohibited to you. And finally, the Ten Commandments. And anybody who... Uh, covets their friend's wife, Yovad Mamono will lose their money. I never saw that in the Bible. Vilasov Bali de Tsarat and will get leprosy. Never saw that in the Bible. Vatidli Liot Nidon Begehinom and they're going to go to hell. Yoraid Veino Ole. They will go down and they will not come up. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. She turns from an object into a subject by her voice, by what she knows. But what I'm also realizing is two things. Number one, she's also a prophet. She, she's saying, I know what's going to happen to you. You are going to lose your money, and indeed he will, and you are going to get leprosy, and indeed he will, and you will go down and not go up. And we know from the end of the story that actually she's the one who knows how to heal leprosy, She's the one who makes a lot of money, and her name goes up and up and up. She's a prophet at the beginning. She's wise in the way of the world. She's wise in Torah. She is a prophet. But there's something better, because I promised you not only her identity from herself, not only the context of their relationship, which is kind of fraught and weird and ambiguous, but also the composition. As I read this, I kept saying to myself, Gehinom, hell. What? Jews don't talk about hell. We're not hell people. That's not our thing. Well, actually, 
Anybody here ever read the first chapter of Pirkei Avot? So there is one section in the first chapter of Pirkei Avot that you like always skip or you're like, mm, like that. You do it like you do, you know, reading the negative parts of the Bible. You know, it's like, mm, like that. Kol hamarbe sicha im ha'isha, anyone who speaks too much to a woman, and the implication is some sort of lightheadedness, we assume. Goreim ra'al atzmo causes bad for themselves. Uva tell me divrei Torah and doesn't spend time learning, wastes their learning time. Bisofo yoresh, and in the end they get gehinom. So I would imagine whoever puts together this first paragraph of this folk tale knows that the more you talk to a woman, the more Gehenim you get, the less Torah you learn. And yet with our woman, the more you actually let her talk, the more you learn Torah, the less you go to Gehinom. That flip, what does that flip tell us about the agency and the subjecthood of women? Because we know you can objectify women sexually by taking their clothes off. You can also objectify women sexually by putting too many clothes on them, right? So that conversation. What does it mean to imagine her as Yosef? What would it be, all of the examples of the biblical characters that she becomes, what would it be if on the week when you're reading the story of Yosef, you said, what would it be if Yosef was a woman? How do you think the story would work out? Or better yet, what if we gave enough time to the voices and experiences of women in our canon that they weren't just sort of once a year, this is when they come up? What if this midrash was something I had learned in 11th grade instead of learning it in my late 30s? Second part of the first act. Next paragraph. Me'asa oto ha'ish. So what did he do? Yom echad ba v'nichnas etzla babayit, exactly like the wife of Potiphar to Yosef. One day he came to her in the house, v'yomer ala eved, and he said to the servant, kachet adli v'leich lish ovmayim, get out of here, go do some task, so that the house would be empty. V'kivan shehalach lamayim, when he went to the water, kafatz ha'ish eleha. Now we have no pretense of her being a subject in his eyes. He jumps at her. And he wants to rape her. And he said to her, Do my will. And the woman cried out a great cry like Esav when he lost his blessing. It's also fascinating, right? Mordechai's vayizak za'aka gedola, I think. Okay? Like, like the men who see bad things happening. Ve'ain Moshiala, no one is saving her. And anybody who looked at Deuteronomy knows that what's supposed to happen is if you're out in the field and you cry, nobody hears you. But if in your house, if you're in the city, everybody's supposed to hear you. And so what does context tell us here? What does it mean when she's not safe in her house? And as we're going to find out, she'd actually be safer outside of the city under a heap of stones than in her own home. In her own home. The domestic, the place for women. When she is there, she is in danger. She wins the battle. She screams, she wins the battle, he gets away from her. But then there's another structure and another context that she can't get away from. And the man goes out to the, to the shuk, to the marketplace, and hires lying witnesses, deceitful witnesses, and said to them, Come and testify. Come and testify that I found her with the help. What did they do? They went before the Sanhedrin, and they brought her before them. We saw such and such that so and so did with her uh, Eved, with her servant. 
Vidanua Sanhedrin Laskila, and it's time for her to get, she's going to get punished, corporal punishment. Miyad, Miyad, therefore, goes from Biyad, she's in the hands of her brother-in-law, to Miyad, immediately she's in the hands of whom? A corrupt court, right? So the systems that are set up to protect her, her home, her court, her family, are all endangering her and all telling her what she is, even as she screams, that's not what I am. That's not who I am. Why do you keep trying to make me that? How am I ever going to be who I am? Miyad, immediately, they put a, an Egyptian rope. What is Egyptian rope? Well, first of all, of course, it's Potiphar. It's Potiphar's wife and, and Yosef. Egyptian rope is the rope that you use to pull a ship. You need to put a rope like that on a little woman? How tall you think she was? She was Jewish. <laughs> You're carrying this person? What kind of threat does this woman pose? What kind of threat does this woman pose that you have to take her out in a chevel mitzri? And on the flip side, imagine Samson with all his ropes around. We know from reading the end of the story, they can put whatever kind of chevel they want on her. It ain't going to work. She's going to break out. They're going to try to hold her in. It's not going to work. And lastly, we have an allusion already to the sailors at the end of the story who use a chevel mitzri. So at once she was in it, and then she owns it by the end. Okay. They took her out to the stoning place, outside of Jerusalem, and they stoned her. And they put upon her a pile of stones. So we know what we have here in Act 1 in terms of her identity, flipping back and forth from object to subject based on the way people treat her, based on the relationships that she has, based on the structures that she's in, and her voice is what seems to retain her as a subject, or she is determined to retain herself, to maintain herself as a subject. But you know, one problem here is that she has a pretty limited um, repertoire of roles that she can play. She can either be the sister-in-law, she can be the wife, or she can be the wayward wife. Those are her three options here. There is no option right now for her to be the pious woman. That's not in the repertoire based on what the people around her see. Now, the writers of this folklore, for them, she's got way more in her repertoire. She could be Joseph. She could, right? She can be a lot more than that. She can flip the script on things that we've always thought of. You talk more to a woman, you're going to actually talk more to her and you're going to learn more, right? But for the people around her, she's got what we call limited possible selves. And I want to think about possible selves for a minute. I want to take a pause from this midrash for a second to move with you to number three, to talk about the idea of possible selves. Possible selves, say social psychologists um, Hazel Marcus and Paula Nurius, Possible selves derive from representations of the self in the past, and they include representations of the self in the future. They represent specific, individually significant hopes, fears, and fantasies. These possible selves are individualized or personalized, but they are also distinctly social. Many of these possible selves are the direct result of previous social comparisons in which the individual's own thoughts, feelings, characters, and behaviors have, characteristics and behaviors have been contrasted to those of salient others. What others are now, I can become. So if I am a young man and I see male role models who are doing X, Y, and Z that are unconventional, we have now expanded what my possible selves as a young man are. If I see women doing X, Y, and Z, that are not conventional, we've now expanded what my possible selves are. If I see trans people doing A, B, and C, and I'm a trans person, I've now expanded my possible selves and what I can do and what I can accomplish. An individual is free to create any variety of possible selves, yet the pool of possible selves derives from the categories made salient by the individual's particular sociocultural and historical context, and from the 
models, images, and symbols provided by the media and by the individual's immediate social experiences. Possible selves thus have the potential to reveal the inventive and constructive nature of the self, but they also reveal the extent to which the self is socially determined and constrained. The sense that you get about our protagonist is that if she stays where she is, her, her spectrum of possible selves is pretty limited. She tries to be a Torah teacher. She tries to explain and, and be a, a woman of the world, and but that's not the way she is viewed. Nobody talks to her, they talk at her, that's what happens. And this idea of possible selves, I've learned, I've thought a lot about possible selves just as a person, do you have role models, who tell, or does society tell you you have to be a certain thing? It's not just about a job or a status, it's also about a way of behaving. So for example, if we essentially tell boys that their possible selves are to be aggressive and confident and always sure, then we're not leaving room for the boys who don't want to be that. And we're not leaving room for actually mediating that a little bit. If we tell girls that they can only be certain things, whether because that's what they see on billboards or because that's all they're reading or because those are the people they see around them, but there's actually another way in which possible selves comes in here which my colleague, Dr. Ariel Levitas, sensitized me to. What happens when a man comes forward with a Me Too claim that somebody sexually assaulted him or sexually harassed him? What, when people see that, how do they respond? Nah, that's not possible. Or better yet, what if he doesn't come forward with his claim because that's not a possible self for men? What happens when a woman comes forward and people place her in one of two categories? Either she's trying to tear the whole thing down or she invited it because those are possible selves that we have. Do we have a possible self of a woman who's angry but actually isn't trying to tear things down but is actually just has righteous anger and indignation. When a child comes forward, our immediate thought, not everyone's, but some, ah, as a kid, maybe they didn't understand. This idea of possible selves is actually very salient. Let's flip back to act two to see how her possible selves start to expand the minute she leaves humanity. When she leaves her house, which is supposed to be protective, her family, which is supposed to be protective, anybody hearing Abraham here, her court, which is supposed to be protective, that's when she's the safest because it opens new possible selves for her. We are on page three. And it was on the third day. Yes, yes, yes. Who liked thinking about resurrection on the third day here? Who was it? Who was my friend who brought that up earlier already? Yes, well, guess what? I saw that, too. I saw that, too, and I wondered about it. And we're going to keep wondering about it. And we're going to wonder about it together. Three days later, Ba Adam Echad Meir Acheret, a person who is not from her family, who is not from her city, who is not from the places that she knows the best and that should know her the best, but actually take her the most for granted and have pigeonholed her into whatever they think she should be. So he's coming from a different city. He's going to teach his son Torah. Now, I said relationships. What is the fact that this is a parent going to do to the way he treats this woman? Interesting. When they got to the house of stoning, it suddenly became dark. They couldn't go to Jerusalem. And they slept that night in that place, and they put their head on the stone, the heap of stones, and they slept in that place. Well, this is creepy. <laughs> Who here would choose to sleep in a cemetery, essentially? A Beit Haskila. Huh. So you all looked at the intertext. So when Yaakov 
ends up lying down on a rock, which in the morning he turns into a gal, right? In the morning he's going to turn into a heap of stones. He ends up lying down on a rock. Why? The Midrash says, Pitom, suddenly, chashachalav. It became dark. It doesn't say that exactly, actually. It actually says, shak'alo chama pitom. The sun went down immediately. Same thing, right? They're meant to sleep here. They're meant to sleep here like Yaakov. And isn't this interesting also that here there is a case of a person coming to her in a place where she's supposed to be disempowered and she's about to be her most empowered. Vayishmu'u kol, and again her voice is what turns her into a subject. They heard the voice, midaber betoch avanim, speaking from within the stones. All you have to see is sighing and screaming and saying, and whose voice is that in rabbinic parlance? That's the way God speaks in rabbinic parlance. In rabbinic parlance, look at the first few pages of Tractate Brachot. God's crying, oily, woe is me that I've lost everything. My children are in exile. She's the voice of God. She's Yaakov's dream. She isn't just Yosef. How about this for compositionally making her a subject? She's the voice of God. Not the voice of Yosef. She's the voice of God, God's self. The Omerit, and she says, just like God, oily, woe is me, kiniskalti belashon hara. For I have been, I have been stoned because of evil speech. So it's speech saves her and speech killed her. And the man heard the voice, her voice. And he moved, he spent the whole night digging her out. Now, do you think she was dead? Who here thinks she was dead? I really think she was dead if it takes the whole night to dig her out. But maybe she's not dead. Maybe she's not dead. She's mostly dead. Thank, by the way, thank you for breaking the tension with the Princess Bride <laughs> connection. That was one of the intertexts I should have given you. It's way too long. Vayar, and he saw Ki Ishahi. She, is a, she was a woman. What did she think? What did, what, did she, what did he think she was before this? What? A ghost, a sound, an animal, right? A batko. Well, remember. Yaakov gets to the place and he realized, oh, God's here, I didn't know. <laughs> She's God again. You're a woman, I didn't even know. By the way, how many times do you think we would find a woman and a man spending the whole night together and there's nothing sexual between them? Watch this, watch this. In, in, in our canon, I'm saying. Watch this. Vayomerla, he says to her, me at BT. Who says in our canon, in our Tanakh? Who? No, no, Naomi. Do you know when Naomi? He says, me at, who are you? And he is startled and says, there's a woman here I didn't know. When does Naomi say to Ruth, me at BT, who are you? After she spent the night finding her redeemer, her Goel, Boaz. The whole setup here is that this woman is going to come out and he's going to marry her. That's the setup. The setup is, please save me, marry me, take me away from all these other voracious men who are trying to eat me alive. That's, she's got more than that as a possible cell. She's not just somebody who's going to be a spouse. She's got more. Vatomerlo, he sa she, sa uh, uh, she says to him, what do you mean? Just like the end of the Ruth story. Eshet Ploni Haiti. I was married to Ploni. Remember? Boaz tries to get Ploni Almoni to marry. Okay. Vayomer Ilaha, he says to her, Malach what are you doing here? Amralo, again, her voice. Only this time someone's listening to her story and takes her seriously. Amralo, he says, and by the way, let's actually start. They ask more questions. He asks more questions than the court did. The court was miyad immediately. This guy is taking pains. He's, something's wrong with the court. There's something wrong with the court. That's implicit here. Kachayama said, this is what happened. They, they killed me and I didn't do anything wrong. Amr and then she says, and look at this 
entrepreneurship here, entrepreneurialism. Amrlo, she says, Adoni, sir, where are you going? Um, Amarla, he said to her, Li Rushalayim, Lilame Torah Livni, to the Hartman Institute. I'm going to Jerusalem. <laughs> Amrlo, she says, Im tolicheni laartsi, ani alamdenu Torah nevi'im uktivim. If you take me to my, my land, I will teach him Tanakh. Wow. Different possible self, right? Expanded possible self that she didn't have at home, even though everybody knew what she knew. Amar love, what? Vichiyodat at lil mode? You know how to learn or you know how to teach? If I had a dime for every time I was asked that question in my life, I, I can't, I can't, I, I can't. Oh, you, you, you spoke without notes. Very nice. I'm like, yes, I imitated someone else and learned from them. I'm sorry, some of my rage has to come out. I'm sorry, I can't just, this can't all be about someone else. Because it's, re- yeah. Amra Lo, she says, yeah. Hain, for sure, Hain. Miad immediately with the same immediacy that the court killed her. With the same immediacy, he says, I believe you. Holy Chala Arzo, Imo, he brought her, did not marry her, did not make her the wet nurse of his child, made her the teacher, okay? Vilimda. Torah Livino. And she taught, he taught her son Torah. I want to take a step back. How was this possibility open to her? What made this possibility open to her? To be someone who would teach Bible. Shira, you have an answer to that? I think there's something to it, but I also haven't looked at the original manuscript, so it's possible that they both say my land or they both say your land, meaning he refers to it as his land, she return, refers to it as her land. I'm not sure. I, I appreciate the question, but I'm not sure. Perhaps, perhaps. Meaning there's no way in which this is the 13th century text, there's no way in which he's not somewhat an, of an object. There's, it's, not, it's not possible. That is beyond the conceivabilities of, of the people. How does she get this option? that she could be a woman who would teach Bible. What do you got? Is this an answer to the question? She's dead. She speaks up. She's self-taught. Oh. oh, my friends, oh, my friends. This is 13th century France. Has anybody heard of women who study Bible? No, no, my friends. Nuns, nuns, and begins, I don't know how you pronounce it, and anchoresses, women who live, thank you, women who live in solitude and study and heal. Look at that. She's got another possible self, potentially, because the world has opened differently, and thus the Jewish world has opened differently. And I want to talk about that for a moment, because when you look at number five, Caroline Walker Bynum, Western medievalist. I mean, I mean, what's the West? But yes, Western medievalist. Being a nun, she says, was almost the only specialized religious role available to women in the early Middle Ages. But however powerful certain middle evil ladies may have been, either as abbesses or as saintly queens, specialized religious roles for women were usually restricted to high aristocracy. Where in the blue booklet on number five, page seven. Second paragraph. It thus appears that, I don't know how to pronounce this word, begins, thank you, you can all fight about it, were a new and attractive alternative, and you can see in the footnote, it's they didn't take vows forever, they could go back to marry when they wanted to marry, okay? New and attractive alternative to traditional cloistered life. For many girls, it was the presence, not the absence, of a prospective bridegroom that activated desire for perpetual chastity. (laughs) You laugh, but this is rather serious. The dangers of childbirth, the dangers of childbirth and the brutality of many marriages led some women to prefer celibacy. Okay, I just want you to think about that for a second. As soon as this woman turns Tanakh teacher to save herself, 
for male rapaciousness in that th there's something reminiscent. There's something reminiscent here. I want to say a little bit more because if you read the Talmud, what you'll see is that we actually have this issue in the reverse. What happens here is that a woman goes to Torah to save her from sexual desires of men, okay? And objectification. In the Talmud, the question is in the reverse. How does a man who wishes to learn Torah live among women, right? Women's, um, I don't know, sexual attraction to women, even being married, can be a distraction from learning Torah. Composition, okay? I want you to just feel how this folklore is taking that question and turning it on its head. Instead of asking, how can a male who wants to be saintly stay away from his attraction to women in order to study Torah? It's asking, how can a woman who wants to be saintly save herself from being sexually objectified? And the answer is Torah, okay? It's an interesting flip. One more thing before we read um, further, which is there is a story that's just like this in the Jerusalem Talmud, and that's number one. Did anybody here get like a little, you know, color out of the lines and read number one? Yeah. Yeah. I knew it. I want to read this story in English before we get back to Army Drash. Is everybody okay? We're doing okay? Okay. Good. That's actually, I was just asking for feedback. That's what I was just doing. So you failed. Page one. Okay, Jerusalem Talmud Sota, okay, chapter one, section four, it's on 16D because the pagination is different, it has columns, D is just the fourth column, okay. Rabbi Zavadia, not Zachariah, number one, Rabbi Zavadia, the son-in-law of Rabbi Levi, would tell the following story. Rabbi Meir would teach Torah on Friday nights in the synagogue in Hamat, every Friday evening. That's already a problem because Friday evenings are supposed to be the time when the spouses are together and conjugally together. And there was a woman who used to listen to his lectures, which means she's not home with her husband. Once, Rabbi Meir tarried in his lecture. He took a long time. When she got home, the candles had already burnt down. Uh-oh, she's late. Where were you? demanded her husband. I was listening to the lecture, she answered. I was learning Torah. That's not one of her possible selves. Her husband said to her, therefore this woman, that is you, will not enter this house until she goes and spits in the face of the preacher. I want you to prove your loyalty to me and not to Rabbi Meir. Now if she were the woman in our story, she would turn and say, let me share with you what I taught, what I learned. I really was there and I learned this Torah and I want to teach it to you. But she's not our woman because she's not allowed to have that voice in the same way. <sighs> Rabbi Meir saw by nivuah, by sacred spirit, and made himself as though he had pain in his eye. He said, is there any woman who knows how to charm the eye, meaning who knows how to heal the eye? Because that is a possible self for a woman. A woman would know the incantations or whatever you have to do to, fit, to heal the eye. Her neighbor said to her, no, no, this is your chance to go home. Make believe that you can charm and spit in his eye. She went to him and said, are you wise and charming? He said to her, are you wise and charming the eye? And from her fear of him, she said, no. I mean, she was intimidated. She's like, I can't play this role. I he said to her, they spit in the eye seven times, and that's good for it. He gives her the answer. Once she spit, he said to her, go tell your husband that I told you to spit only once, but that you spit seven times, meaning you're so loyal to him that you spit seven times. His student said to him, Master, is this how one should scorn the Torah? Had you told us, we would, have, we, we would, would we have not brought him in and hid him on the couch and have him been appeased and appease his wife? In other words, he didn't have to spit in your eye. She didn't have to spit in your eye. We could have brought this husband in and been like, Go back to your wife, let your wife back into the house, and you're being ridiculous. He said to them, should not mayor's honor be like the honor of mayor's creator? If the holy name written in holiness, scripture says that it will be erased in water in order to make peace between spouses, in the case of the sota, is not the honor of mayor that much more so? I want to leave 
I don't actually want to leave that last part. I want us to put these two stories side by side. In both stories, there's a learned woman. In both stories, there's some um, impropriety that is alleged. And in both stories, there's healing, and the woman can be a healer. But feel how different the possible selves are in this story, in these two stories. She has no way. The answer would be for the students to come and beat him up until he lets her back in. Whereas in our story, the agency is so starkly different, and it's not because people were feminists. It's actually because they knew of a role that women played like that, and therefore they could be that. Human beings, we're smart. We're not so smart. What we need is we need a lot of categories. And if we have a category for you, then we, you fit. And if we don't have a category for you, we better start working on a category for you so that we'll know who else to fit into that category. So I want us to be aware that possible selves is not about the salvation of humanity. It is about a slow, adaptive change slog where what you're trying to do is expand the possible roles so that when we in our infinite need for order try to label people, we have a label for this person so that they're not just a deviant or they don't just get stuck in some other label, right? So just as, a, just as an aside, <laughs> okay? What's amazing is that what looks to us as she's gonna teach Tanakh, she's so pious, could also be the only way that she can empower herself. But we're not done because she's gonna go back into a house and when she goes back into a house, she's always in danger. The bottom of page three, we're in only act two. Can you believe it? We're going to be here all day. Yo, I wouldn't mind it, but if you need, yeah. Okay, Yom Echad, one day. Natan Ever Habayit Enavba, the uh, slave of the house who she had been accused of. I mean, it's an incredibly literarily um, coherent story. The slave, she'd been accused of sleeping with a slave, and now a slave actually wants to sleep with her, okay? Ve'amarla and said, Hashmili, listen to me, va'asi ritzoni, and do my will, va'ani atten lach kol and I'll give you whatever you want. Again, don't think this is subjectivity, this is harassment. Velo avta lishkav imo. She didn't want to sleep with him. When I, when I read this, I said to myself, have I ever seen the word avta, wanted in the feminine, in Tanakh, ever, ever, ever? I couldn't find it. And then I said, what's lo ava? didn't want the story of Amnon and Tamar, where Amnon rapes Tamar and he didn't want to listen to her as she said, don't do this, don't do this. Look at how imaginative the writers of this folk story are. They take that and they turn it into, she didn't want to sleep with that Eved and so she's not going to sleep with that Eved. But just like in the first act, she's going to win the battle, she's going to lose the war because there are circumstances beyond her control. Me'asaha Eved, what did the Eved do? Lakach sakin echad, he took a knife, v'ratzah lahorga, and he wanted to kill her. V'hika tanar, and instead he killed her student, her pupil, the child. V'harago, and he, and he murdered him, v'ivrach, and he ran away. V'hakol nishma, and the voice was heard, b'veit avi hanar, ki meita elem, that the child died. Vayomer la'isha, and he said to the woman, look, me'achar shekenu, now that this happened, I know you didn't do this, but l'chi mi beiti uti'i l'darkech, first you got skila, first you got stoning, now you're getting galut, exile, which is what happens to the accidental murderer. You're going to get exile for somebody else's accidental murder. Ki v'chol eit sh'ani ro'eotach, every time I see you, libi so'er v'home albani. I'm a tempest inside about my child. Let's, let's raise this up for a minute. The collateral damage. The collateral damage. We now see that what happens here, it's not just that she gets stones or she gets exiled. It's in the course of this, lots of people get hurt. A child gets hurt. And pit om, all of a sudden, that which was her ticket to normalcy has disappeared. And now, of course, She's going to go in act three to the, the sea and she's going to wait for it to split, as somebody put it to me this morning. She's going to wait for a miracle. She's going to become Jonah. She's going to become Yonah. She has had a lot of possible selves so far. 
She's been able to be Yosef. She's been able to be God's voice. She's been able to be um, a Torah teacher. She's been accused. She's been able to be the wayward woman. And now she's about to be, as Chris Hayes put it to me when we were learning this together, she's about to be the most effective prophet in all of the Bible, Yona. All she needs is five words, boom. She's not Yosef, the tribulations, and the da. She's not under the rocks. She's going to say it's going to happen. And here we go. Well, of course, the only way she's going to survive is if she gets away from the places that are supposed to protect her. So she's got to go. What did the woman do? She walked on her way. And when she came to the edge of the water, came a boat of listim, of brigands. And they took her captive. Object. They're not, it's not for polite conversation. Vashem, ah, God, for the first time, God. This is scary because what's about to happen is what's going to be said is it's not just that she needs to be away from the places that are going to protect her, but only God can actually save her from becoming an object to someone else, which means human beings are not capable. It's a wild, wild thing. And so just as God in the Jonah story brings a ruach se'ara, a wild wind, al hayam, to the, to the sea, bayam, and there's a great tempest, exactly from Yonah, and the boat is about to burst, and the sailors see, and they all call to each other, and they say to each other, let's have lots and see who, whose fault this is. By the way, just to say, if Yona had been a woman, he never would have survived the boat. I just want to say, meaning if we ever took our male protagonists and turned them into females, and imagined what would have happened to them, the story would go very differently. And I think that in itself is a worthwhile, it's a worthwhile activity that the writers of this Midrash are engaged in. We'll know who's causing this. And they make lots, and the lot falls on the woman. And they say to her, Tell us, what's your job whoa whoa everybody who are you will you do my bidding what are you doing here do you know how to teach what do you do what do you do for a living and she answers in yona fashion vatomer lahem she says ivriani i'm a hebrew and i am god fearing parentheses unlike all the people i've come into contact with the exception of the guy who wants to teach his kid Torah, right? Because he's God-fearing. Who made both the water and the dry land, meaning I feel safe here. I'm going to be fine because God is watching me. She tells them their whole story. It's like Wendy and the Lost Boys. What did they do? They said, oh my gosh, no one has ever taken care of you. Like, we, the sailors, a pirate, it's like, the sit. They're like, please let us give you a blanket. What does it say when it takes a brigand pirate sailor to say, I'm going to have rachamim on you? Because the structures that are in place so do not in society itself. And God made a miracle. And nobody tried to sleep with her. That's a miracle. Fascinating. It's just fascinating. I mean, this is unbelievable. And they sent her out to the dry land, and they made her a little house by the sea. But this house is not going to be a dangerous house for her. You know why? She, it's hers, and she lives there by herself. Right from Yona, and the, and the water's calmed. And along goes the boat. And she stayed in the place. And she becomes a rofanit. She becomes a doctor, a healer. And God gave her access to all of the herbs, just like King Solomon, who could talk about all of the herbs and knew everything about them. See 1 Kings chapter 5. 
V'hayta merapet bahem, and she would use these herbs to do what? To heal kol zav, male seminal emission, umitzora, and leprosy, you know what's coming, right? V'kol choli, and all other sickness. V'alta ha'isha, and the woman went up, mala mala, she went up, up and up, Batikbot zahav v'kesef larov, and she collected a lot of money, until everybody heard of them, her, like Solomon. So just like she said at the beginning, the guy who tried to rape her at the beginning, he's going to go down and down. Implicitly, she's going to go up and up. He's going to lose his money. She's implicitly going to, he's going to die of leprosy. She's going to be able to hear leprosy. I'm also interested in this possible self because this is the first time she actually has any power over men. It's, the first, it's fascinating. The whole time, she doesn't. It's, okay, she can teach Torah. She, but here, somebody would have to come to her and ask her to heal them. So what's she going to do with that power, I think is an important question. What's she going to do with that power, I think is an important question. So God has to intervene. She's in a powerful position over others. Everybody knows who she is. But do you know why everybody knows who she is? They know who she is because she's not right in front of them. They know who, they know who she is because she's outside. That's why they don't objectify her because they can't, they don't have power over her. They can't do it. Liamim, in number four, on, on page four on the bottom, she goes back to being Yosef, when now it's not Yosef when the wife of Potiphar, when he is in the servile position, is trying to um, rape him, but actually now it's Yosef and his brothers where he is in a powerful position and the brothers are in a weakened position. Okay, paragraph six. Liamim, after some time, Chazar ba'alali Yerushalayim mischorato asher hayagarsham. Her husband came back. This was a long trip, ladies and gentlemen. I, this, was, this was a long trip. I, okay. He comes back, and he hears that his wife had been stoned. What did God do? You notice we had all the Me'asah Eved, Me'asah Isha. What did this one do? What did, this, what did God do? God is the district attorney. God brings leprosy on those people who had testified against her, ve'al achib ala, and against and on her brother-in-law. Shema, shamu, they heard shematronita achat. What question? The example that we have of lashon hara and sarat being a result of lashon hara is Miriam, and here it is. It is clearly not a woman who is getting tzarat. Can we keep going? I'm worried. I'm worried, okay? Shamu, they heard shematronita achat. Wait, can I ask you a question? So, so far she's taught, she taught Tanakh, right? So I was like, oh yeah, it's similar because nuns could be involved in Bible. But now it's actually more than that. She's kind of in a monastery. She's really on her own. She's not with any... She's not with any, she's really on her own. And by the way, sort of an implicit critique, she's not poor. She's not interested in being poor. She's very wealthy, right? So I, now I just want to say that I'm putting together in my head, not right now, I did this before, but I'm pretending that I'm putting together in my head right now <laughs> that holy cow, she starts this story by saying, anybody who rejects her husband, it's as though he rejects, they reject their creator, Okay, that's strange. Husband create? I don't, I don't really put those two in the same. And then after three days, she's resurrected. And then she teaches Bible, and she's a healer, which is things that nuns do. And she's supposed to heal leprosy, which is what Christian doctrine says Jesus does. So I'm really curious how this story is going to end. <laughs> I'm really curious about the, how this story is going to end, because what they're really presenting is that what makes her safe is actually following the Christian paradigm of celibacy. I'm just saying, meaning that, that's, what, that's what's happening here. I'm kind of wondering how this is going to end. So her husband comes back, and they heard that there's a matronita, which really means a Roman no noble woman. They may not even know that she was Jewish. <laughs> so she's three things that they're not, right? She's maybe a Roman woman. So they, they don't have any power over her. She's far away. She's a healer, and they need to be healed. Amru They said to each other, Let's go. 
Vayomer ha'isha lechiv lechiman. And the brother-in-law says to his brother, come, you should come with us. <laughs> yeah. Every time these two talk, something not so good happens. <laughs> All four of these people went until they came to her place. They came to her, Joseph style. She knows who they are. They don't know who she is. And they said to her, another word that I got, I got to be honest, I'm not a power hungry person, but I love this word. Adonatenu. Our master, female, Adonatenu. There's something, um, when, I, when I saw that word and then I realized how many times I've learned in my Jewish education the word Adon and that I've never learned Adona or Adonit, I, I actually, I got sad. I'll be honest, I got sad. Because if we talk about possible selves, your possible selves are constricted by what you actually see. Okay. We came from a, a far away. And you know, he really did, the husband, because he had been. You see what happens in this story? Everything flips. The husband went to do business. Now the wife went to do business and is in a faraway place. We had a bad court at the beginning that killed the wrong person, and this court is going to kill the right person, though we'll talk about that. Okay. We came from a faraway place. We heard about you, that you're really good. Take our money, take our money, and heal us from our leprosy. And this is where it gets interesting, because I only told you a little bit of where this was come from, okay? But now I have to really tell you where it's from, okay? Has anybody here ever heard of Arabian Nights? So Arabian Nights is a compilation of um, Islamic folklore from the centuries between the 8th and the 14th, okay? There is a story in Arabian Nights called the Jewish Qadi and his pious wife. A Qadi is a judge of halakha, of law. In that story, there are remarkable, remarkable, remarkable similarities. I want to share some with you. It's the brother-in-law, the false witnesses, getting stoned, a passerby in the evening, child getting killed, criminals building her a home. She becomes a pious recluse. She makes them confess, and she gets back together with her husband. All that is in there. Should I tell you what's a big difference? In the Muslim version, she forgives them. She forgives them. So let's read. By the way, that was the best sound I could ever want to hear. Amr <laughs> Lahem, do I have it? Only right here. It's now the signature of my email. <laughs> I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this, okay? I want, wait, I want you to think about this. I've been doing things that are very Christological here, okay? which I think is true, and I, and I see, and the fact that it's a 13th century French text which I only found out after noticing those Christological elements is true, but the trope of the pious woman who is able to shield herself, or rather in the other texts, most often unable to ever shield herself, even through her piety, that is a trope in Muslim, Christian, and Jewish folklore. Amralahem, she says to them in five, Lo uchala sot this is not just a doctor, this is a theo theology doctor. I can't all she brings in God all the time. From the beginning. I can't do healing for you. Lishumadam for anybody. Unless they give me their worst sin. Kilo yo ilo, because the healing won't work. Amrula, they said, kazot kazot asinu, this is what we did. And I imagine them to say, like, oh, we walked into a room and we didn't kiss the mezuzah. You know what I mean? Like something. <laughs> Amrulahem, I didn't put on my right shoe first in the morning. Like one of those things where what they're doing is pretending to be pious. You know what the Midrash says about Esav? That he would ask his father, how do you tithe, I think, salt or something? Meaning something that, like, makes you look excessively pious, but you're not. Okay? Amrulahem, <laughs> what's your biggest flaw? I'm too competitive. But that's true. Amralahem. They said to her, they, she said to them, Ro'a ani al gedolim atem. 
I know that you're big sinners. You didn't tell me everything. It doesn't matter. You, the longer you keep this a secret, it's not going to help you. This is one of our last. What did they do? Sipru, they told, just like she told her story to the sailors who believed her, just like she told her story to the guy outside of the Skila house, and he believed her. Sipru vehodu, they admitted it, velo boshu. Now, it's not clear if that means they weren't embarrassed or it means they didn't hold anything back of the details. I don't want to assume it means they had no shame about it. I would, I would, Occam's razor, sort of, I would say, the, at minimum, they didn't leave out any details. And they told the whole story in front of the woman's husband. How different is this than the woman who has to spit in the rabbi's eye and the rabbi has to give her a trick? It's Amrlahem, she said to them, Hare Otem, you've done bad. Ufichem anabachem. And your mouths have t- just, uh, testified against you, right? Words, speech, talk, voice has been throughout. Voice could be what's the rumor, voice could be what she said, voice could be the scream, voice could be their admission. Voice is very powerful. Bishvu'a lo aselechem rifua. I swear I won't even give you a healing. No healing is going to help you. Because God is not a human being who lies. I'm really sorry, but I can't help to, but see the Christological choice here in saying, my God's not human. This is going to be, there's going to be some polemic here. We're not done. We're not done. We're not done. Now she's going to teach us Tanakh. After God said to Moses, God's chosen one, and, and um, God's servants, the prophets, as it is written, do not walk as a gospel in your, in your people. And don't stand idly by the blood of your friend, which is they did both. Gossip brings to bad things. Ve'atem rishaim and you bad people, ani Yosef, ani ha'isha hanitzeveti machem. I am this woman who's standing with you. Asher asitem et kol ha'ot ha'ila. You did this to me. Ve'hotzeitem uti l'skila b'shvil l'shonchem sheker. And your lies led me to the skila house. Ve'hakadosh baruch hu hitzilani leman rachama v'chasadav harabim. And God saved me because of God's mercy. V'zehu ba'ali. And let me introduce you to my husband. Asher holachtem lifnechem elai, that you've brought to me, by the way, that you brought to me. Vakadosh baruchu yodea razeolam. God knows the secrets of the world. Vitaalumot sitrei kochai, and all of the secrets of those who live. Vakol seiter mevila galoi. God will bring all secrets out into the open. Shenemar vaseiter panim yasim. And God will give secret a face, which is not the meaning of the pasuk. If you looked up the pasuk, which is in Eov, the pasuk is actually people who do bad things in secret give a face in public. Quite the opposite. And those three guys, they got their leprosy, and they got killed. And they died. Miad he kir ha'ish kol and the husband understood everything that was happening. and knew that this was his wife. and they were rejoicing, v'tovelev, and happy, v'natnu shevach leboram, al kol anisim elu, and they gave, um, they gave um, praise to their creator on all this. Okay. Why doesn't she forgive them? In the other versions, she forgives. Why doesn't she forgive them? Who here is happy that she doesn't forgive them? Who here is sad that she doesn't forgive them? So I think it's really interesting. What happens here is that God gets a good rap here for killing the right person and not the wrong person. And the idea of this entire midrash is that even when human structures fail, God is the ultimate structure. God is watching. Now, of course, that brings the question 
three questions. One, what happens when you don't have a happy ending like this? What happens to a, person the a person's theology when they don't have that happy ending? What does that do to a human being? Two, what does it mean to say, well, humans can't get it right, so God will get it right? You notice in this whole story, although she says it's God's miracles, it's actually not. It's actually people. She raises her voice. That guy walking his kid decides to listen. She is able to explain her story to sailors who listen to her. Meaning that question of who, so what does it mean to carry out the divine will by acting in the world? And how much of it actually is that we're never going to see justice without some sort of miracle, right? It, it is sort of playing on these. And it's no mistake that this is a pasuk from Eov, where Eov is talking about the fact, or talking about his perception, that people who do bad never get caught. And he basically says, they're never going to get caught. I hope they get caught. And here they get caught. So this is a redemptive story from the perspective of who said that this is the people of Israel, right? If you think about it as the women are the people of Israel, first of all, what does it mean for the Jewish people to imagine their story as a woman's story? It's remarkable. But second of all, that hope that at the end, even though we're getting kicked around, that at the end something's going to work out and we're going to be able to live happily ever after, what does that actually mean? I'm going to open to questions in a minute. I just want to say one more thing. One more thing that I want to say is I think that there's something here that's asking very deeply the question of how is it possible to have a sexual identity for men, for women, for people, and also to respect the other parts of our identities and other people's identities, and for not, not to take over everything. And what's interesting in this story, I think the Christological elements, what's actually happening, and this was a live conversation, which you can see at some other point in number six, this was a live conversation in the medieval Jewish European discussion, which is, we don't have the option of celibacy. So they move her into even the ascetics. They said, you know what? The way to do this is to move sexuality to the side, meaning don't have any, men should go to a, become monks and women should become nuns and that's going to help us out. But that's not the way this story ends. This story ends actually with the happy ending is that they get back together. So there's some sort of polemic here that's saying this is one of the ways that you can actually work those things out in marriage even as we know that at the beginning it was her husband who put her in danger to begin with. So it's very complicated. The questions that this Midrash are asking are very deep, and I don't think the Midrash gives easy answers, even though it's telling us, and they're happy at the end, it's, you're, you're left very, with a lot of discomfort. You're left with a lot of discomfort. So by way of ending, I will just say that every time I've learned this Midrash in the last six months, I have learned something new about it. I had a conversation with Yehuda about it the other day. I hadn't thought of the Israel perspective. I had a conversation with somebody else today. I hadn't thought of the Shlomo perspective. A few people pushed me on the Chavah Mitzri perspective. What I would ask is that the kind of audacity that these folklorists have in being able to take the story and fill it with so much is the same kind of audacity that we should have to think about how we can use stories like this not as oh, this is something I'll silo for when I want to talk about that issue, but how it actually reflects on the canon kulo, on the complete canon, because that's the work it really does. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few questions. We have 13 minutes. I'm going to try to go this way if that's all right. And, and you know what? We do have a conversation after lunch, so if you want to do that, let's do that. Can you tell everyone your name? Sarah. Sarah. I probably like two things. One, the serpent was not punishment in the beginning, um, and if it was adultery, it was accused of punishment in the punishment. And the other thing, why, why wait so late to punish it in terms of the hypocrisy of the It is thought punishing that it's 
So let's talk about why the Eve at the beginning of the story doesn't get Skila also. I actually don't think it matters, which is what's so unique. Our protagonist is the one we care about in this conversation. We actually don't care about anyone else. Why does it take so long to, I mean, we care about the child, but we don't see what happens with the child. I mean, this is the destruction of their home. Another question is why do we, um, uh, why do we wait so long? Well, this is exactly it, right? It doesn't take a lot of faith to know that God is watching you if you see the one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the evil and its punishment. What takes faith is the way. That, okay, what takes faith is the way. Yes, please. So, it's Suzanne, and um, it's not clear that she ever actually was raped or that ever, she ever, ever had any So I think the fact that she is able to get away from everything is actually very unique. And if I, um, where we go? One second, one second, one second. One second. She is a little bit super human. Mm, I will tell you that in the um, in the Muslim version of this story, what happens is actually the child is not her student. She's actually hired as a wet nurse for the child. Which is how you get a sense that maybe the Christological is actually the Bible they were looking for. But she's teaching Bible, but and she gets beaten for the death of the child by another woman. There's a lot, there's a lot to do there. There's a reason why I didn't give you the other version. Because when we when 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 the text is in our canon, there's so much Judaizing that went on for this text. I wanted us to study that first, as Lauren said to me earlier today. She said, look, you want to talk about Breshit and Enuma Elish stories or Mesopotamian stories, it's only amazing once you've learned Breshit for real. So I took that as my, and I think it, I think it worked. Thank you for that. Yes, Adina. I wonder if this is a direct history rather than a Rabbi Nair story. Could this be a corrective to the Rabbi Nair and Guria story? And what she's talking about is that in the Gemara and the Zara on 18 A or B, I don't remember, so Rashi brings this story, so we're talking medieval, right? Same idea, Western Europe. Rashi brings this story of Bruria being seduced. Rabbi Meir's very pious and very scholarly white being um, seduced. I think that's a fascinating idea, and I cannot wait to try to figure that out. But to ask people who specialize in medieval, I love that. Yes, please, Neil, what's your name? Ian. Ian. I just wanted to uh, stress, I think she was raised because it says that she's a So I think that she cried and nobody was coming to save her. You're saying, I think she cried and, and it actually happened. I totally hear that. And that goes for me to the end, issue of forgiveness. Because I think that there was a story in forgiveness in that she forgave her husband for exposing her this way. And that he forgave her simply because she was, in a sense, as people think about it, many, many marriages do bring up when they happen. Um, and, and I think what's, and what's just one other aspect of that, uh, I'll, I'll come back to it. I, I think that's a great point. I Meaning the question of their relationship being, oh, they're happy, go lucky. And, and wondering what actually happens in these situations. And the other piece of this was that when it talks to Shomra, uh, the Obdal is around, the Midrash is attached to that, is that God says to Adam, keep and guard everything in the garden. And it's called Ayla Not, it's called Set. Because if you destroy them, uh, there'll be nobody to fix them. They will be damaged. Sure. But she's also, that's an objectification of her also, talking to her about her as though she's guarded me. Yes, Ben. Um, is this an anti rabbinic polemic? Because yeah. the, it's through the rabbinic court that she's put to death. And she survives three days on her own. Maybe it's a miracle, maybe it's not. And when she's teaching, She's only going to teach Tanakh. Yeah. It's a very personal Hashem acting agency and no rabbinic help. So what I think is interesting, I would, I'll tell you what I chalk this stuff up to. One is I chalk it up to folklore style, which is sort of the individual relationship with God as opposed to going through some sort of intermediary. 
Two is rabbis have stories like this about themselves. So anti-rabbinic is not generally the way I go, but anti not the way I roll, but anti-rabbinic is all is also the question of actually looking at some of the structures that are supposed to be doing the right thing and are doing the wrong thing, I think absolutely there's a critique here. No question about it in my mind. How come she has to go, not to her Yavam, who's supposed to be taking care of her, not to her court that's supposed to be saving her, but she has to go to brigands. Yes, there's a deep critique here. Yes, oh my goodness. Everybody should come after lunch. Uh, yeah, Zohar and then Aaron. How is the story received historically? Because Yurian seems to be the most accurate, and yet it's kind of shocking that for most of Jewish history, I don't, I don't know if people draw enough lessons from it. Here. So in 1915, Rabbi Judah Eisenstein put together, printed this Otsar Midrashim, which is small Midrashim, which had not been printed in other places. And people started looking at this, like what exactly is this? So if you look, Eli Yassif is a folklorist, and actually Yona pointed this out to me, I hadn't seen it. He talks about this, and I totally disagree with his read for the opening, that when the husband says to his brother-in-law, everything is hunky-dory, and he really tried his best. I don't actually think that's the case. So I think, I think even when people take a look at it, we're gonna read it in different ways. And quite frankly, I think that's the beauty of it because this is such a contemporary problem and new elements of its contemporariness <coughs> are coming up, and this is a great springboard for that kind of conversation. Eric. Just a small observation. I appreciate you pointed out the time horizon, and it, it seems to dovetail very nicely with the beautiful story itself, which takes mm-hmm. 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 Thank you for teaching me something new. She said, this is like the Yosef story, it also takes 20 some odd years to happen. It's a long stretch. It's a great, that's a great, great point. Um, Brent? Um, it seems that one of the redemptive roles for women is often being a mother. And I'm yes. wondering if you have any thoughts on why that's so obviously absent from the story. So here's the thing. I don't, A, I don't know. But B, I think that if we're really thinking about um, the way this is bi- bibliocized, that it's turned biblical, that her being a mother would not allow her to be a male figure. Mm-hmm. Meaning her being a mother would have turned her into a classic female figure, and the folklorists here are doing something much more interesting. So I, I think that's true, especially given that Muslim versions of this have her as the wet nurse of, of the child. Yes, please. I can't, uh, Judy, I Thank you for help, reminding me. But feel that Nina is been forgotten. Like I was surprised her voice seems to come in this. And and I've been wrestling with the whole Dina story anyway because there's so many statues that came in. So I'm curious why was the problem. Like well, where's Dina's voice? Well, here's the thing. What they do is they model her after people whose voices we have a lot of. So you you have something to work with. But there's something implicit there too that in order to tell her story we need to look to male paradigms, right? So on the one hand, it's like, oh, you don't want to have to look to male paradigms, but on the other hand, look at what an amazing partnership this is. I mean, it's not saying, hey, you women, you're stuck in your problem. It's, hey, you know what? I have experiences, and I can help engage and help people understand what your experience is because they understand my experience. And that's something, and that's like, that's incredible. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible, it, it's just incredible. To, to my mind, to be able to do that. I'm gonna take um, one from over here, Andy, and I think we have three minutes left. We'll see if we get done. Yeah, Andy. First of all, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. No problem, my pleasure. So um, I think many of us, as you know, at our institutions for the last many, many months have been dealing with these questions. Have you begun to write, or will you write something using this article, using this midrash as um, a guide for Jewish institutions, like the Alem, and then the, the depth that comes maybe even underneath this is, why, like you found this, why haven't other teachers found this? <laughs> like why has this been missing from our canon? Okay, so I how, think one of the reasons why, like she's, she's saying am I gonna write this up to be something that will be helpful to people? I would write this up only in consultation with any of you, meaning not you don't have to sit and write it with you. But I wanna know what parts of this are helpful to you. Right. What parts of this, Right, meaning I don't just want my read. 
right? That's one. The second is, how come nobody knows this midrash? Look, I'll tell you how I stumbled upon it. I stumbled upon it because earlier this year at the mood, I was supposed to do a conversation with Cheryl Cook and Stephanie Ives about Me Too. And I said, well, you know what? There's a very strong uh, ethics of bystanders in, in Torah. So I looked for Lo Tamba Dabriya. Don't stand by idly. But that's what I looked for. And then I found the Yosef story here. Meaning, then I found this Midrash. Meaning, I just I went into responsa and I looked for it. And there it was. And I was like, this is going to change my entire life. And I, this, it's just, it's going to change my entire life um, to be able to share this with people and to be able to see it myself and learn from it. So what I would say, I would say two things. Number one, Otsar HaMidrashim is full of these. Full of these. Not this story, but so many different, and the way that they work in with other Midrashim and other folk, it's gorgeous. Expand our canon, okay? Expand our canon, that's one. And number two, I actually think that we don't just kind of like, all right, I don't know, I'm just gonna sit and Google around and see what happens. I think we have our canon, we have the things that we use, and to be honest, the way that Torah grows, the way that people grow, is that we stumble upon things. So how can we stumble upon more things? And I know you're rabbis and you're busy and you don't have time to stumble upon things, but part of the idea of come to Hartman is that you might be able to stumble upon some things. So how do we stumble upon things and how do we encourage people to stumble upon things? Thanks so much, Andrew.